Hello and welcome to another video. It has been a hot minute since I've actually produced one. Uh, as you can tell, I probably have a beard since the last time you've seen me. I can't remember. It's been a while. Isolation's really doing that to me. But what I'm going to discuss today is the stability of the biodiversity out in the marine environment because you might be wondering, maybe, who knows? I don't know what you're wondering. You might be wondering, is our biodiversity decreasing or increasing? What's happening? We're having such a huge effect on the environment. Are we actually affecting the biodiversity? That's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. I'm also gonna chuck in one other interesting report I've read. But before I get there, let's just roll that intro and get this video started, cause it's been a while. Researchers at the University of Birmingham have discovered something rather interesting about the biodiversity of our oceans. In fact, what they discovered is that the biodiversity of our oceans is neither increasing or decreasing, rather it's remaining quite stable. By utilizing the fossil records over the past two centuries, the researchers were able to collate the data for regional scale patterns of a geological time from the Cambrian explosion to now. What the leading researcher, Dr. Roger Close, identified was that global biodiversity patterns are not so much global. The reason for this is that the parts preserved in the fossil record or parts preserved through fossilization change through geological time. This means that ultimately the current biodiversity scales are a tad misleading. In fact, they don't necessarily increase at a continuous state is what's happening. When compared to previous studies of global biodiversity in the marine environment, it shows a steady, continuous increase over 200 million years. However, the conclusion that these researchers came up with, or were able to illustrate, was that these regional, or these global, I should say, global biodiversity scales neither increase nor decrease, but have remained steady for over several million years. This conclusion was primarily based upon the fact that there are a lot of fluctuations involved between individual groups of species. An example given was that the extinction of the dinosaurs made way for a boom in other species. Primarily gastropods were able to explode or expand their species range because another species was able to be removed. They denoted the term ecological reorganization, meaning that the removal of one species or the removal of a group of animals, groups, I guess you could say, made way for another group or another species to boom, creating a steady increase in biodiversity in among the environment. Because you take something out, something else takes its place, so we're not necessarily losing a biodiversity, we're losing an animal group. So this brings me to my other topic, the removal of megafauna from the oceanic environment and how this may or may not affect the global food chain as megafauna are highly, highly important keystone species in the environment. I figured it'd be nice to add it in considering we just spoke about uh, a stable biodiversity, uh, stable global biodiversity and what would happen if you remove one species, something else should take, a, take its place. So what's going to happen if we remove a keystone species and how that could affect the environment? Megafauna are defined as very large animals or animals that exceed a body mass of 45 kilograms. They are highly important species in the environment or scientifically known as keystone species in biodiversity or in their environment. Here's just a small list of why they are so important in the oceanic environment. One, they maintain structural integrity of food webs. Two, they transport nutrients between environments. Three, they modify habitats. And four, they connect ocean systems. So how the researchers were able to, I guess, come up with future extinction scenarios was that they compiled a list of known megafauna for the ecological purpose of understanding them purple, understanding their ecological purpose in the marine environment. Using this data, 
They then tested future extinction scenarios to determine their overall purpose in the marine environment and how they affect ecological functionality. Doing so, they introduced a brand new metrics called Fuse. Functionally unique, specialized, and endangered. Fuse. This metrics helps to identify and determine any future extinction scenarios by removing keystone species. They predict that if current scenarios continue for the next hundred years, meaning if we don't change our habits and the environment continues to gradually get worse or change too quick for certain species to adapt, there's going to be an 18% loss in megafauna species, meaning an overall loss of 11% in ecological functionality. Not great. Not good at all, actually, because that just means that a lot of species are going to suffer. Not just the megafauna, not just the marine environment, but every environment that's connected to it. They then went on saying that if all marine endangered species were to go extinct, we'd see close to 50% if loss in ecological functionality. That's bad, the very bad. The newly designed metrics fuse will allow researchers to determine the overall purpose and effect specific species have on the environment based on their fuse score, which will allow us to determine the overall ecological functionality and what would happen if we remove that species from the environment, what cascading effect are we gonna have, what cycle are we going to destroy, and who is gonna be affected. Currently, some of the high scoring fuse members on that list are green sea turtles, dugongs, and sea otters. Therefore, utilizing this matrix, or if we are going to be able to utilize this matrix in future scenarios, future scientific workings, we'll be able to determine ecological effects before they may happen. Sounds like a plan to me. Sounds pretty good. Even though overall global marine biodiversity is neither increasing nor decreasing, we're at kind of kind of a stable equilibrium, there's that worry of a tipping point. It's neither stable nor unstable. It's neither here nor there type of thing, okay? Because if you remove a keystone species from that environment, we could see potential cascading effects down the food chain. We could see shifts in ecological functionality, as we just explained, in global systems. Predicted possibilities using the fuse matrix are already showing potential effects of removing megafauna from the environment or removing keystone species from an environment and how they can affect our ecological functionality. How do we stop this or how do we mitigate or prevent future causes? Easy. Well, it sounds easy, hard when you put it into practice, I guess, because it's a collective decision. We continue to decrease our effects on the environment. We continue to mitigate our emission output. We continue to decrease what we're putting into the ocean and continue removing the bad. So if we continue to collectively mitigate our effects on the environment, I can't ensure that what we're going to do is, I guess, going to stop it. It's not going to stop it. We're too far gone at this point. But what we're going to do is mitigate or slow down, would be a better word, slow down our overall effect on the environment. Because right now, we're going, we're reaching probably bullet train speed. We want to go normal steam powered train, okay? That's what we want. We want slow, so we can understand, so we can identify and somehow adapt to an ever-changing environment caused by the effects of humans. Hope you guys like that. I'll see you in two weeks time. Thanks for watching. Let's get done around again. Make sure you check out Kit Life down below and I'll see you next time. Bye.